Hello everyone and welcome to today's Inside Local webinar. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today and we have got a fantastic hour ahead of you to be packed with uh, excellent insights and tips from our, our wonderful panellists. Um, we're lucky enough to be joined by four charming, intelligent and highly experienced marketeers today uh, and their topic for debate is best practices for local on-site optimization. And I'm very glad to welcome back uh, our four panellists. Uh, let me uh, just bring up the slideshow and I can show you uh, their beautiful faces. We have uh, Mary Bowling, Matthew Hunt, Mike Ramsey uh, and Guy Sakalakis. Uh, I'll give them a little introduction so you know exactly who they are. Firstly, we have Mary. Now Mary is the co-founder of a specialist local digital agency called Igniter Digital. Uh, she's actually been teaching and coaching people in local search since 2006. She's one of the founding members uh, of Local U who provide uh, training and advice on local search marketing to SMBs and SEOs. Uh, she's a regular speaker at conferences and is also a long-time contributor to the Local Search Ranking Factors study. Next we have Matthew. Now Matthew is the COO of Powered by Search. They are a Toronto-based uh, marketing agency. Uh, before Matthew got all serious and got himself a serious job title, uh, he ran uh, his own local search consultancy for many years. Uh, as well as uh, a number of e-commerce sites. So he has a very broad um, uh, experience in, uh, in search marketing. Uh, he's also a speaker at regular events. He blogs a lot about uh, all things related to local search and is also a contributor uh, to the Ranking Factors study. Uh, Mike Ramsey runs a very successful marketing agency called Nifty Marketing. They're based in Burley in Idaho. Uh, he also has a sister business which is called Nifty Law where they specialize in helping uh, legal practices uh, with their online marketing. Uh, he's also uh, on the faculty uh, of Local U. Uh, he's a regular speaker at events like SMX and State of Search and is also uh, a contributor to the Local Search Ranking Factor Study. Uh, and we have uh, Guy Sakalakis. And Guy uh, is the founder of AttorneySync, uh, which is a digital marketing service that also helps uh, um, uh, legal practices, attorneys, etc., uh, with their online marketing needs. Uh, recently, Guy set up a second agency called ELP, uh, where he sort of translates a lot of that information and insights he uh, he has established uh, with the legal sector uh, over to a kind of more of a broad cross-section uh, of, uh, of local businesses. Uh, he's also a regular speaker at events and also a contributor uh, to the Ranking Factor Study. Uh, and we welcome all of you back uh, to Inside Local. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today. And also a big thank you to, um, to our attendees. Thank you for signing up and showing up today. We will make sure that we use this hour of your precious time uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, as well as the panelists, we have uh, three people sort of helping things run smoothly behind the scenes. We have Lindy Bouquet from the Local Search Forum, uh, who are the kind of co-promoters and organizers of Inside Local. And working with her is Conan Nielsen uh, from Imposio Marketing, who are a local marketing agency uh, based in Toronto, but also with locations uh, in the U.S. as well. They'll be handling the kind of text Q&A uh, and answers for you today. Uh, and then last and most definitely least is myself. Uh, I'm Miles Anderson. I am the CEO of Bright Local. And so a big thank you to everyone and to also to our customers who have joined us today. Uh, this is the agenda uh, for today's webinar. I'll leave it on the screen for 15 seconds or so so you can scan your eyes down that. This is what we will be running through. Um, all looking uh, at how these things impact local on-site optimization. Okay, so um, the first thing we're going to do is just run a quick poll. I'm going to put it on the screen for about 30 seconds. Um, and if you could all please answer that, um, it would be uh, much appreciated. The question is, how much time do you spend on on-site optimization? And I'm just going to share the answers uh, on the screen with you now. Uh, and what you can see is um, the looks like the majority of people are spending uh, between 20% you know, and 60% uh, of their time on on-site. So it's obviously dominating um, a lot of people's days, some people spending less, some people spending more, but you see that you know, maybe around 50% of time, uh, of the time is spent on on-site optimization. So uh, it's obviously something that people um, keen to understand about and learn more about, which is what we're going to do today. So um, let's just start off with a little bit of an overview. Um, and the way this works is I'll ask a question and I'll pick one of the panelists to answer it and then uh, other panelists can kind of pitch in after that. So um, the first question, um, Mike Ramsey, we're going to put this one to you. Where do on-site tasks sit on your priority list? When you're looking at the, the, the full range of work you can do on a customer, um, where does on-site sit in the priority list? Uh, you know, for, for us at Nifty, I would say it usually is at, at almost at the very beginning. So 
And, and the reason why, I, I think if your on-site is off when it comes to local, that no amount of link building, no amount of citation work, no amount of about anything else will really translate uh, to very much if, if things are uh, not functioning well on the website. And so, so usually that's one of the first steps is just identifying and auditing and fixing the things that are necessary there before you can really move on to a lot of the offsite factors that can then really start to move things. Um, so, so to me, I look at it as the foundation uh, of, of what needs to be done in local. It's, it's definitely the base layer. Okay, that's great. Um, Mary, um, can you pick up the same question? You know, how, how, how high on the project list is on-site sit for you and your work you do? I pretty much have the same um, ideas that Mike Ramsey has about this. I try to get that site into good shape, SEO-wise, the first thing. Um, it's something I can do rather quickly. It's something I usually have complete control over. I don't need to wait for somebody else to do something. And as Mike said, it serves as the foundation for the rest of our project. Now, that doesn't mean that we can go in and fix everything. They have site structure problems or um, bad linking, and that's something that we're going to have to work on over time. But if I can get uh, crawlability working on the site, and if I can get those page titles and meta descriptions and H tags in shape, sometimes that is enough is enough to have them start ranking uh, initially or ranking a little bit better for some of the terms that will start bringing in some traffic. Okay, that's great. Um, Guy, going to come to you, the next sort of point down. How much time and effort um, do you spend on these tasks in relationship to, uh, to other optimization activities? Um, so how much time? It really depends on the problems that the site has, so, and, you know, and how big the site is. So, if the site is already has this great optimizations on it, it's not a very big site, it won't take very long. Um, it's a really big site and it's got all sorts of problems. It can take a long time. In fact, uh, in some cases we've seen it can take months to untangle some of the on-page stuff, but it really depends on how big the site is, what kind of problems they have. Um, and then, you know, it, it's, there's also there's the fixing component to it, and then there's kind of the ongoing where you might do things to your pages, you know, to test different things or to see if, um, you know, particular on-page optimization has some impact. But, you know, obviously if you're, when we do that, we're very clear with our client about um, performing those tests. But, yeah, it can take a lot of time, especially if the, if the site's really big. Okay, great. And uh, Matthew, I'm going to come to you for this one. When you're, what are the most important goals when you're considering the on-site optimization aspect? And, what kind of KPIs do you, do you use to measure success of onset optimization work you've done? So goals-wise, you know, we have our team all the time benchmark before we start doing work. Um, I, I think a lot of people probably on this call are people who do work for clients most of the time, and I've seen that as sort of a mistake, not being able to explain value or, or how your on-page optimization is actually improving things. So you definitely got to take a snapshot of before and after. Um, and what we usually do is we always usually start with like an audit. So we have actually a checklist and give our guys about 138 items they need to go through and find out what's broken on the website technically for on-page uh, SEO. And um, if it's if it's out of whack, it could be a ton of things, just like he had said that, you know, some sites need months and months worth of work. I, we find, generally speaking, that if it's a large site or enterprise type sites, you could spend a lot of time um, optimizing those sites. And you also usually get the greatest effect from, you know, an enterprise or franchise established site versus a smaller business one. But if it's a small business website, you could whip through that in, in 30 days and fix all the problems and get on to some more interesting things. But, um, you know, usually it's the ABCs, title tags, H ones, alt tags, content optimization, and deep link So this is Matt, I may have a little audio problem. Um, Mary, coming back to you for that question, what kind of KPIs do you use to measure your know, on-site success? Um, although people are going to um, kind of cringe when I say this, you know, one of the things is landing pages, uh, rankings, um, traffic, on-site traffic, but mostly we're looking at conversion. So if we can 
can really get to focusing on conversions and what we want to consider to be a conversion and how we can use little mini conversions to move people through the, the sales funnel, then um, that's what we are most interested in. I, does it make me cringe, Mary? Okay. That sounds great. Right. Right. Uh, that doesn't make me cringe, Mary. No, that sounds right. You know, I mean, obviously, there's a bit, a bit of an anti -rank, anti rankings uh, sort of debate, but yeah, certainly sort of focus on conversion um, I mean, and delivery of, of kind of customers and revenue. Uh, I think everyone would agree is the, the right thing to be focusing on. Um, great. So let's move on to some some even more specific stuff. Let's look at uh, kind of recent algorithm kind of updates. And um, a question uh, for you, Mike: What impact has the pigeon update had on your on-site strategies, and have you changed those strategies? Here's the pigeon. I, I took a focus on more of an organic path in, in my local search work uh, a few years back where we just started focusing more on picking up traffic uh, outside of NetPacks. And, and I felt like the Pigeon update really rewarded us on that front because of the organic si uh, signals that, that were part of Pigeon that started being taken into consideration elsewhere. I would say the one thing uh, that that definitely has changed though is, is dealing with the location proximity to things. Um, it, it's, it's taken me even more on a hyper focus so it's, it's not enough to, take, to just have content or to have uh, things built around a city. I think you have to start really diving down into the neighborhood levels and, and we did a good job with that before but um, now I mean it's it's not like an extra add-on bonus. It's like what is necessary to, to do well, especially for service area businesses. They just really have to have a good footprint and good content around um, neighborhoods and not just a, a city. Um, mm -hmm. And and so that's that's really about the only change. Um, but most of those things, I think people should have been doing ahead of time and so so the people that were probably affected most by pigeon were those that only cared about map pack rankings uh, and and weren't putting a lot of focus on their website and on building um, building more just local content around around their neighborhood cities uh, states uh, anyways so so hopefully most people saw a pretty good uptick um. Matthew, what's, what, how have you seen the sort of you know, the impact of Pigeon on, on the strategy you're employing for the customers? Um, I, I think Mike nailed it on the head there. You know about the, you know the, the map radius getting smaller, needing the focus around the neighborhoods, and also the focus on you know your your number one asset is still your website. So we've seen over the years. I think everybody here on this panel has seen how uh, how the maps are showing up completely different. You know. Um, over and over again, whether it's going from a seven pack, a ten pack, to three pack, to one pack, to having images to not having images. I mean, it's just going to constantly change. So you know, uh, the best practice is always focusing on your website and making sure you have great local content that makes sense and unique content. Um, I think, you know, particularly for multi-location businesses, having unique content on those um, store locator pages is is key. But uh, yeah, you got to. Uh, what, what Mike said, you got to focus on your websites and, and and neighborhood content as well, not just the city content. Okay, great. Uh, a question for for Guy. Um, behavioral factors, um, which is not kind of related to sort of pigeon, but was just was, was an element of you know, the ranking factor survey and growing its importance. Could you explain to our audience a little bit about what behavioral factors are um, and why we should really take them into consideration and think about them uh, in terms of the on-site strategies we employ? Sure. So uh, some of the things we think about with behavioral are, well, generally speaking, it's uh, what your visitors, users are doing, where they're coming from, how they're interacting with your pages. Um, and I, I think that it's becoming more and more clear that those certainly have an impact for anybody that uh, doesn't think that they do. Um, and then so you, once you embrace that, you know, how your users visit your site and how they leave and how they enter uh, matters, you've got to start thinking about what you do to improve, uh, you know, how they're engaging with your site and prevent and really stopping their search, right? So stop it, preventing them from leaving your site and going back to searches and performing a second search. So um, yeah, you know, when it comes to on site, it's you know, on a very simple level, it's about creating engaging content. I think one of the things that sometimes is counterintuitive. Uh, because we are so focused on conversions, right? Those are the things. Those are the business metrics that really matter. 
uh, sometimes it can seem that those are at odds uh, with improving behavioral factors because you might do something to get it, the kind of conversion you want, but that that behavioral signal that's being sent from that, whether they, you know maybe they're filling out a form or calling and closing their browser or clicking back to perform another search, um, those can be tied to what you're doing on your site. And so that's one of those areas that's, that, that's sometimes tricky is that you want to motivate users to do to convert, but does that conversion uh, cause some behavioral signal uh, that you know may, might be problematic? And so things you can do are you know you can get people to click through multiple pages first, uh, you know. But again, when when conversion is and as it should be, when conversion is uh, paramount, sometimes you know the conversion that you want might be in sending a behavioral signal that is not as advantageous. So then you find it's, you know, you've got to you know, decide what your sort of primary objective is, sort of focus on that, but try not to have a negative impact on you know, behavioral factors or, or, or sort of vice versa. I would sacrifice conversion for a behavior, to improve a behavioral signal, um, but I think it's worth considering in how you're setting up uh, conversions and how you're, what you're doing to uh, motivate users to click through multiple pages versus, you know, if, if all of your conversions, if all of your entrances on your own page, which is unlikely, but if they were, and all of your conversions were on your home page, you're likely going to see, even of converted users, you potentially see a lot you know, higher bounces and exits on the home page, whereas you might do something uh, to get users to click through more pages on your site. Um, but again, I wouldn't do that as a sacrifice of conversion. I just think it's, it's another layer to think about um, when you're doing things on your page. But at the end of the day, it's still, when it comes down page, doing things on your site that are going to compel users to want to read your site, maybe watch a video, take some kind of conversion action, but uh, limit them wanting to go back and, and, and not satisfying what they were searching for in the first place and performing another search. That's a great answer. Thank you, Keith. Um, Mary, kind of following on straight off that, what sort of tactics do you use to combat things like bounce rate and you know, load time on site to you know, A, improve conversion, but also um, you know, tackle these behavioral factors? Well, I think one of the things we have to keep in mind with a local site is that sometimes people land on a page, get the information they are looking for immediately, and they're done. And they actually are going to turn into a conversion for you. They're going to call you on the phone, they're going to get in their car and drive to your place of business because they were looking for a phone number or they were looking for an address or a map or some directions or they wanted to know your hours. So in local search, I would not necessarily think that people landing on your local landing pages, the pages that have your um, basic local information about where you are and how to get in touch with you and how to get there. Um, bounces from those, I doubt that Google sees those as something bad. I mean, they, they know the type of behavior that they see on your good websites, too. So I wouldn't just assume that if people are bouncing from location landing pages that that is a bad thing. Um, but other than that, I think one of the things that a lot of SMBs have trouble with is focusing their site on the wants and needs of the user instead of on themselves. They tend to want to um, talk about how you know, thump their chest, talk about how great they are, instead of thinking more about why did this user come to the site, what are they looking for, and how can I help them with that. And sometimes if you can kind of refocus the website from that me, me, me to thinking, you know, addressing the user and talking about their problems and how you can help them solve their problems, that that helps with um, retaining people on the site. And then the other thing I see a lot with um, small business sites are these dead-end pages, blog posts that don't link to anything, pages that, you know, other than the navigation, it's just a thought that doesn't try to lead the visitor anywhere on the site. So you have to kind of think about um, guiding people towards the conversions or the mini conversions that you'd like to see from them. 
Okay, that's great, guys. Thank you. Uh, an excellent set of answers there. Um, we're going to go to our second poll, which is uh, obviously for the attendees. Have you adapted your on-site strategy because of the pigeon update? Okay, I'm going to close that down now. Uh, I'll just put the results on the screen. So what we can see is that um, 43% of people said uh, yes, they've changed it a little. Um, combine that with yes a lot, we're up at uh, 52%. So 52% of people have said uh, yes, they've changed it. Um, but another 12% uh, have said uh, they're going to review it, and 8% said they don't own a pigeon. So um, <laughs> obviously, you know, if you're able to go out there and buy some pigeons uh, and, uh, and obviously update their pigeons because of the update. Uh, but looks like the majority of people have either made some changes uh, or are reviewing um, their, their strategy uh, in light of pitching. So, uh, guys, thank you very much uh, for voting. I will uh, turn the slide back on and we'll go to the next section. So, this is looking at uh, local landing pages specifically. And um, uh, I'll come to, uh, let's go to, uh, to Matthew, the first question. Matthew, what's the key to you know, a successful local landing page uh, in your eyes? Uh, sure. So. I think there's a lot of different elements um, that, that are important. Um, at the end of the day, so we, this kind of leads from what we were talking about before, where we were talking about usability um, and people's experience and bounce rates and things like that. So the first thing is to any page on your website ever, it needs to be useful to users. I don't worry so much about um, previously what we talked about, we were talking about having a, a bounce rate or trying to manipulate that. I think that um, that's not really something that Google probably looks at. I think they look at dwell rate or they're looking at whether you're going back to the search engine and researching for the same search term that you just searched for if they weren't satisfied from finding what it is. But like Mary said, a lot of times in local search, people are just going to come to the page, find the phone number, find the location, get the information they need, and move. And that's okay. And as long as they do that and they don't go back to Google and research for the same search term, like you know, Plumber Toronto or something like that, and it's not, it's going to inform Google that you probably found what you needed to find for. So on all landing pages, make sure that the people who are looking for what they need to find is there. If you don't know if the information is there or not, I highly recommend that you do something really simple. Just go to usertesting.com and you can pay users. It's, it's pretty cheap. I think you get like five users for 250 bucks or something like that, or even be less. Maybe you get 10 for that. I don't know what it is. But just pay for people to go to your website, use your website, and watch them stumble around. And you're immediately going to see if you have any major choke points or problems around sort of UX, sales copy, and so forth. Now, on an SEO side for creating unique landing page, I mean creating landing pages locally successfully, is you need to have the standard you know stuff that's there, which is your name, address, and phone number clearly. Ideally, you know some sort of um, you know. A map and phone number and form and a clear CTA and then have some unique content below the fold so you know design it that they can get the information they need right away but if you want to reach for more keywords you know mix in unique testimonials or driving directions um, I know Mike Ramsey here he'll probably get asked the same question and he could probably list 20 30 amazing things that you can make a page unique by uh, and creatively by so these are just a few things that you could do that I think leads to a successful landing page or local landing page. In fact, I am going to bring it on to Matt, uh, on to, uh, to Mike next. I know Mike, you produced a, a while back now a great kind of anatomy uh, of the ideal um, sort of the local landing page. Oh, yeah. What's, oh, your, yeah. Mike, what's your sort of, when you look at, you know, what you're really trying to do with this sort of local landing pages and considering what you talked about a second ago about having a really hyper-local content now, um, do you think what you talked about, you know, a year or so ago, that anatomy still holds true? Uh, what is your kind of, your kind of, your, your, your kind of kernel of what would deliver a successful local landing page. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, abs so that's from, so Mike, that's, uh, Matt, that's going to be from Mike. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too many so, better so, be. Better be. <laughs> so I don't think that uh, the, the fundamentals have really changed all that much from, from what we did initially. I think layout layout has changed and and probably the amount that you could put into a local uh, a local page or a local site or something on, on behalf of a brand has changed. And so I would say that the place that I've really started to look at and and try to hone in on as we've started to relook at this uh, over over the past um, you know few months is 
that local content is a lot more than just words. Uh, it's, it's a lot more than just words with one pretty picture on the page. I mean, you can, you can localize about everything. You can localize your, your products, um, events, uh, your building has a lot of, uh, it, it itself is a local piece of content, you know. Um, there's a lot of video work, uh, there's tools that can be created, uh, reviews from your customer, uh, the design, just, it just all of these different things that can tie into it. And so while I think you have the fundamental things that you have to have, which, you know, you could check off as, as a list, and, and I think the infographic um, that, that we did a long time ago still has that base. What I think the difference in, in today's market is the people who are going to go above and beyond that are those that, that understand they need more local content. Um, it's not just words, it's not just images, it's this entire group of things that can be used uh, in, in multiple ways to, to, to provide um, people the content that they need the way that they like to view it. And not everybody is going to, to like their content uh, delivered in the same way. And so, you know, it's, it, it starts getting into identifying your local audiences and understanding the personas that you're trying to reach and what, what would most likely pique their interest or, or speak to them um, more on a personal level. And so I think you can't look at it as a one-size-fits-all thing anymore. You have to, you have to create um, multiple avenues uh, for, for each market or each neighborhood that you're really trying to work, work in. And so that's, that's where I think it's changing. Um, but you definitely need the fundamentals, which is, you know, uh, a landing page, uh, a, a basic set of landing page or landing pages for a given market that, that explain your services, your products, um, the processes and, and different things. And the way you do that will just change dramatically. Okay, that's great. Um, question for, for, for Guy going to the, the next point down. Looking at, say, you know, different structural options that you have, like subdomains versus subpages, can you maybe explain a bit, you know, why each of these has got different merit, you know, why you might use them and when you might use them, depending on the type of business, the sort of size of business that you're doing. I see a lot of this question about, you know, should I have subpages or should I use a subdomain? Um, I guess, Guy, does it really matter? And if it matters, when and why? Um, uh, yeah. Interesting. My, I tend to recommend subpages. I know a long time ago uh, there were people that, you know, you thought about things like having page rank within the same domain versus Google Trade subdomains as separate websites. But um, I think that a lot of that is, uh, you know, not as just kind of a red herring issue these days. I, I do think there's we've seen that there, at least in legal, there were a lot of attorneys who would love to do the subdomain for a city and and in the local pack those actually did pretty well for a while I don't think that um, I don't know if that depending on how you do it, if it that's like uh, a per se spam flag but the way that a lot of the firms were doing it it looked very spammy so I tend to recommend doing sub pages uh, I, I actually I've seen a couple uh, bigger companies doing subdomains um, I don't you know, unless it's like a, unless there was like some kind of uh, site architecture issue where subdomains have made a lot more sense, uh, I tend to recommend subpages. In fact, off the top of my head, I'm kind of blanking on a great example of, of choosing a subdomain. So if somebody else wants to chime in, feel free. But I usually think, you know, subdomain, you got to have location pages for your, uh, you know, your physical location, and then doing hyperlocal content in subpages. So if you can do you know, uh, an example might be that you, if you're uh, if you're something some business that's related to traffic safety, you might do like a dangerous intersection thing. I know that's a popular type of thing, and and you get a lot of people that actually talk about it, comment on it, share it, and so like that local page is hyper local. It's talking about street names, intersection, neighborhood type uh, conversation that's really powerful and local. And so I, you know, I'm kind of going down the rabbit hole, but. Typically, I recommend subpages. No, that's great. Because a lot of the threads that are coming in here, you know, focusing around sort of hyper local uh, and delivering that kind of content in the way that kind of users want it. Matt, um, at uh, Power, Power by Search, I'm right thinking that you work with quite a few um, sort of multi location businesses and larger sort of businesses. Um, how do you tackle that subdomain versus subpage um, decision or discussion? Uh, 
Yeah, sure. So yeah, sure. I always so, say, it, I always it, say it. It, it, it just depends. And why I say it depends is because it depends on what they already had sort of set up. Like sometimes we get enterprise clients who are already using a subdomain, which has a lot of domain authority, and I don't want to move away from it at that point. So we make the choice to do that. But if there's something that's not created, you know, we would probably move towards what, what Guy's recommending, which is to go sub pages so that at least we can sort of uh, maybe they're not the right word, but leech off the domain authority of the root domain. So that's where we would lead if we could start from fresh. In this case, but if something is, is established and it's ranking well and it has lots of authority already because it's been like that for the last 10 years, we're, we're not going to change it from the subdomain format. Okay, great. Thanks. Very good. That's succinct answer. That's excellent. Uh, Mary, next question to you. Um, talking about kind of, you know, kind of really you know, geo-optimizing pages down to you know, a hyper-local neighborhood, you know, even the zip code level, what advanced tactics do you employ? What you've done, you know, the ABCs uh, of good localization. You know, how do you take it to the next level, and how much more value can you get out of doing those advanced tactics? Well, it's really hard to say what's advanced and what isn't because sometimes I think, you know, I talk about something that I think everybody knows, and it turns out that they don't know it. So. Um, I'm not necessarily saying these are advanced things, but some of the things that can help with kind of reinforcing that you are a real business in a real location are embedding a Google Map on the page, um, having a link to Google Maps so that people can get driving directions to your place, maybe putting some driving directions directly on the page that includes talking about some local landmarks. Uh, you might be next to a shopping center or across the street from a big office building. Um, placing snippets of reviews on the page that reference location. Um, XYZ plumbing came to my neighborhood and um, fixed my faucet. Those things really seem to help. Um, it shows that you're, you're servicing clients in particular locations that you want to rank for. Um, and then also putting a few nearby neighborhoods or towns on the page can work for you, but don't overdo that. And sometimes you'll see 50 towns uh, on the footer of a page. That is obviously not a good practice. Um, but mostly I, I, I think that those cover the, the things that most of us can do. I think that we can also put a, if you have a multi, multiple locations, that a KML sitemap is probably a good idea. And then don't forget your internal linking with these pages. You want to make sure that your, um, if you have, say, a, a directory with multiple stores in the directory that you're linking to other stores that are nearby the store that that page is about that you're linking back to the main page in the directory that uh, lists all of those locations in that particular city or neighborhood. Um, I think that's about all I can think of right now. Okay, that's great. That's all I can think of right now. <laughs> that's great. That's really good. I'd like to loop back to, uh, to Mike, actually. Mike, um, you know, with your kind of landing page as an experience, what do you do to really move the, the needle a little bit more uh, when you're kind of hyper-locally optimizing um, pages? Um, um, I would say the most important thing is the title tag followed by your internal linking. Uh, I, there's, there's sometimes where just fixing internal linking is enough to move a lot of pages uh, on a multi-location site, uh, just, just really up in search results. Um, the, it's, outside of that, it's straight up good old-fashioned off-site link building too. And, and a lot of those links are manual because people don't link to location pages. They just, they're going to link to the brand homepage. So you have to do a lot more focusing. And maybe instead of linking to just one individual location page, uh, you, you try to, to give as much authority to a state page if it's linking to all of these other you know, city pages in that market so that that, that um, link equity spreads spreads pretty well down to the city pages below that, or to a city page so that the neighborhood pages do well. Uh, I, I think I think when it comes to your your on-site location pages, it's usually that there's you know adding additional content uh, can can be very helpful, but if you're just looking at it from a pure ranking perspective, 
I, I've, I've not seen anything move it as much as just really looking into your title tags and really looking into your internal link structure. Um, everything else has more incremental gains. With your internal linking, how much of it is structure about you know, the number of links and the pages that are being linked from, and how much of it is the anchor text that's being used, and where do you sort of put your focus? I, I actually think a majority would be where it's being linked from compared to the anchor text. Um, I, I mean, anchor text definitely still has its place, but on an internal link, uh, I think uh, we've, we've seen things by just putting even the brand link or just the location, so it's like Boise location or something like that. Um, so not necessarily specific anchor text on site. Uh, by having a link move closer from the home page or having a list of the, the top locations, you know, maybe it's only five of your just absolute top linking from the home page, then that matters a lot. And you'll see this across a lot of big brand sites, and they're, they're tricky on the way that they do it. They say um, our most popular locations, and that will give you the list of what they care about. Usually it's their top five that they're trying to rank for, and they're just looking right from their homepage to these five top locations. Uh, and, and we see that a lot. Um, and and it's, it can be very, very effective in just boosting those specific pages up. Now, on the flip side, uh, you know, what, what a lot of people would think is, oh, I'll just list all my locations there. Um, I've seen it have the, the negative effect if it's taken too far, and if you have 100 or 200, or heaven forbid, a pop-up with 1,000 links on it, then all of a sudden, you know, you've just killed every one of your location pages. So you have to be selective, um, but you just start, I, I don't want to call it link sculpting, but you got to start link sculpting a little more on, on where you want some of that before you go. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's great. Um, we'll, we'll move on from this topic, but uh, yeah, some really good, uh, some really good insights there. Um, next one is looking at uh, content. We've got a webinar happening on the 11th of February, uh, which is looking at powerful content creation ideas for local businesses. So we're not going to spend too much time kind of looking at content today. But um, a question for Guy: When you're looking at a, a kind of customer, you've got things like product pages, um, which are you know, which are kind of evergreen pages, promoting their kind of products and locations, and then you've got kind of blog posts. How do you see? Um, the value that each of these brings, where do you put more focus when you're trying to impress upon a client the importance of content, and where do you think more effort should be spent? Is it on product pages or on you know, creating blog posts? Um, you know, not to dodge, but I would say both. The thing about product pages are that unless you're constantly changing your product, your, your product pages tend to be the product that you offer. So. Um, you know, things you can do to optimize those, but you're not, I mean, you're not going to be regularly add, most businesses aren't regularly add, adding new product pages. Um, blog posts, on the other hand, you can write 100 blog posts about a particular product. Um, again, for, for legal, which is what we spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, you might think of a product page as a service offering type, um, you know, analogy. And again, there's not, you're not going to be regularly creating new ones. Does that mean they're not important? Of course not. Um, but you know, you can, there's a lot more you can do to promote product pages, um, whereas you're not just, you know, product pages aren't the type of thing that you're just regularly churning out new ones uh, for most businesses. You know, there might be some exceptions to that, but um, I, I think they're both important and they both have different uses. Uh, one thing that was on the previous slide that I think ties into this too uh, was the use of social links uh, for different pages and whether they're a distraction or they're useful. And so a lot of businesses will say, oh, yeah, I've got to have social links. So everybody, I'm going to put social links on all my pages. So people are going to tweet my home page. They're going to tweet my product pages. Um, and it's just kind of silly because there's so many pages on a site that social links just have no business doing, you know, no business there, and you can look at it, they never get shared. Blog posts, on the other hand, are something that people are more likely to share. Um, if you can do something on a product or service page uh, or some other type of page that's worth sharing, then great, put social links on there, but uh, this idea that you just paste or you put in a plugin on WordPress, like an add this plugin on every single page of your site, then it is distracting. They're never going to get shared. And in fact, it just kind of looks out of place on those kind of pages. 
Yeah, I would agree. I, I did kind of jump over that last point just for the sort of sake of time. Um, looking at the next point now is, you know, you know should all corners have a local focus? We've talked quite a lot about that, and there's been uh, a definite agreement that yes, you know, you should try and um, sort of locally focus your, your content as much as possible. And I'm sure we'll cover that next week. But I want to look at the next point down, and I've already come to um, uh, to Mary for this one. Where does the responsibility for content creation sit? Is it with you, or is it with the client, or is it is it dependent on the nature? and the specific client you're dealing with? Um, it depends. Um, I think that, you know, we have a um, SEO copywriter on call that that's who I prefer to use for content for websites because I know that she understands SEO, that she's going to spend the time talking to the client to make sure she understands what they want to communicate and she's going to do a really good job of it. So I do not build any content in those cases. Um, some, for some types of businesses, you really need to have somebody that's intimately familiar with their products or services. They're, they have to be the ones to write the content because it doesn't make sense to anybody else. Um, it would take me or a big copywriter to um, forever to understand their products or services the way they understand them. And an example of that might be a software as a service type software. It's very complex. Um, and in those cases, what we do is have them write it, then we try to edit it for SEO, but we always send it back to them if it's real technical um, so that they can check it for accuracy. Because, as I said, we just don't understand their products and services as we can. Um, in a lot of cases, you have small business owners in particular that, you know, they want us to just give them guidelines so that they can write the content themselves or have somebody at their location or their college-age child or some, their wife or somebody write the content for them. Um, and a lot of times, you know, that's based on the fact that they have rather small budgets. And which we can certainly understand. So um, we try to give them guidelines, and then we edit it for SEO as needed. Sometimes if we go back and forth with them a couple of times on two or three pages of content with us really coaching them, that's all they'll need uh, in order to just take the ball and run with it and create a lot of good content on their site. But just as many times, this content creation task as to a person who already has a job. They already have enough things to do at the business. And and if they if are expected to do it, a good job of it in their spare time, um, a lot of times you end up with not very much content on these pages, which is not a good thing. So it's a, a constant battle to get enough good, useful content on pages and I try to get it done however I need to to get it done. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, Mike, uh, sort of back on to you uh, around that point. How do you kind of work with a situation where a client is stubborn about helping you to produce content? Do you have a, a good systematic approach that you take with that, or do you just kind of take over the reins if the client isn't delivering what you need in terms of content? We have uh, situations where we run all the content ourselves. And then we have quite a few situations, especially with some of the big companies we work with where they have like in-house in -house content abilities. Um, as part of the content strategy, we try to walk through specific steps that will help us identify specific goals, um, build the brand voice, and, and follow a, a fairly detailed calendar and an idea around what we're trying to do. And it's, it's just basically following the content strategy. And I think at that point, whether our team does it or they do it, as long as they follow the rules um, and, and stick to basically the plan that's been outlined, that it, it doesn't matter who's creating the content um, if, if they do that. Um, so so that's, I, I would say in those situations, the most important thing you can understand is what a content strategy is and what a content strategy is not. And, and following that content strategy to the T whether you're creating that or or um, your client is, uh, so and that's that's a hard thing. Trying to sit down with a small business or even a medium-sized business 
and get them to focus in to build a true content strategy where you're identifying the goals, um, you're creating brand rules, you're doing all of these different things. Like after session one, like getting session two set up to do this is very, very difficult. And so I think you have to try to simplify it as much as possible um, as an agency and try to work as, as many things as you can to hand over to them on your own time. Um, and, and if you do have a client that's willing to really spend that time doing it, then the better off you are. Uh, if, if they get that and they're willing to produce that, then you can really point them in the right direction and just be more of a guide and a consultant in that content and how it should be posted, where, how it should be shared, um, and what you're doing with that. And so uh, that's, I, I would recommend everybody study content strategy, not content marketing, but actually content strategy and, and figure out the rules, the different things that they need to have in their practice so that when it comes to the content marketing side, um, you know, their team and everybody else involved in the project follows, follows the correct procedures. That's great. Thank you. Really good uh, advice, Mark. Thank you for that. I'm just going to actually skip over the next poll for the sake of time because we're running a little bit behind time. Let's talk about kind of mobile optimization and um, the importance, uh, the kind of growing importance of mobile and how that affects kind of content uh, and kind of online strategies. So, um, Matthew, uh, coming to you for this one, how much time and effort do you spend, you know, kind of optimizing a site for mobile bit content or structure? I said, well, Matthew, I'm just going to skip over you for now just for, and, and I'll come back to you. Hopefully your, your connection uh, straightens out. Um, Guy, what's it for you? Is, is it, Guy, when you're looking at you know, kind of developing a site or updating it, do you take a kind of mobile first approach? Yeah, certainly. And just to uh, reiterate, we're responsive design is the uh, key from a design standpoint. Um, I think some of the things you were alluding to, would there be different uh, pages you might create for a, someone that's looking for certain information on a mobile device? Uh, we don't really do that. Um, uh, our focus is, is to provide the users information that they need about the business, no matter what device they're on. Uh, I know that there are different takes on that, but um, you know, our we're not we don't do we, we try to make our design fit uh, mobile first and then grow from there. And, and sometimes there might be some layout differences, but um, typically the, the call to actions are, are the same type of things. There you might have. Uh, like a section that that might be more geared towards thinking about the kind of information that someone might need on a mobile device, but uh, for the most part, um, we don't we don't distinguish pages or distinguish site design from you know mobile desktop or tablet. Okay, great. Um, Mary, come to you. What do you? How does mobile influence? You know, a content strategy you might have for a customer, and and do you actually give it any consideration, or do you just think of um, all customers in a, in a, a kind of holistic sense uh, and just trying to create the best content that gets you the conversion that you want. Um, so does mobile have much of a, of a play in your mind when you're considering about the content you're creating? I think that most people need to concentrate on responsive design because most SMBs, you know, we're, we're talking about small budgets here. So we need to do what we can to maximize those budgets. And the way to do that, of course, is through responsive design. But I think that the, one of the things that people miss with mobile is they need to go through and make sure that everything on their site actually works the way people expect it to on a mobile phone. Um, I am continually amazed when I go to websites and try to move around that I, it doesn't work right. So that's obviously the most frustrating thing for users and what's going to get them to abandon your site. But you need to make sure that click to call is enabled. You need to make sure that um, what you want people to see is shows up first on those location landing pages, uh, which is probably the phone number, the address, and a map. And um, you also have to make sure that you're tracking mobile because most of these small business clients have no idea how much traffic is actually coming from mobile devices. I'm finding across the board 30 to 50 percent, and with some particular types of business, it's upwards of 80 percent. So um, if you can get that tracking set up right, it can give you a lot of ammunition to go to the client with and say, this is worth spending some resources on. 
Which type of businesses are you seeing um, get the most and least sort of mobile traffic? Um, uh, amazingly, um, lawyers are getting a lot of mobile traffic these days. Uh, and that may just be noticeable to me because I've been working on a lot of lawyer sites lately. But, um, you know, theaters, restaurants, huge amount of mobile traffic. Hotels, especially hotels that are not in destinations but maybe side of the road type hotels for travelers are getting huge amounts of mobile traffic. Okay, great. Um, Mike, question for you. Obviously, you've, uh, and I agree as well, you, you both got interests uh, in the legal sector. But um, question for you, Mike. Obviously, you've got, you know, you've got kind of, uh, you know, it's nifty law and you've obviously got kind of nifty marketing. How do you, how do yours experience sort of mobile traffic uh, to different types of businesses? Is it similar to what Mary's seeing or are you seeing, you know, kind of other correlations or other interesting, um, you know, uh, instances? Um, overall, I'm just seeing mobile traffic increasing everywhere especially in, in social sharing, like if we're doing any type of content that we're trying to promote on, uh, let's, let's say we're trying to locally promote content on Facebook, then 60 plus percent of that traffic is most likely going to be mobile. And so we do have to think about that in the type of content we're promoting. If you build a really big infographic uh, that just sucks on mobile, it's probably not going to get the same amount of shares if you're trying to share that as, as content that is um, responsive. Um, so so I do think you have to take it in mind when it comes to the content you're producing, uh, ensuring that your videos can be played, ensuring that when you do load a specific blog post that your images aren't blown out, that throw off the entire post. There's little things like that, but, but at the end of the day, uh, I, think, I think a lot of mobile is decided initially with the build of the site and then the effectiveness and the ease of using that uh, is, is just something that is checked uh, for accuracy when you when you are creating something. Uh, we're, we're still not at the point where we're saying, oh, this is a mobile specific piece of content that we're creating and, and we don't care about desktop at all. You know, uh, I, I haven't had a piece like that, but we definitely have looked and said, man, you know, if we were to launch this blog post now, it does not look good on a mobile device, so we need to ensure that this gets fixed, this gets fixed, or else we're going to kill a lot of our sharing abilities with it. So. Okay, that's great. Uh, going to get to the next slide. We can, um, we've touched on conversion uh, a fair amount already, um, but a question for um, for Matthew, and hopefully Matthew's audio uh, is back with us. Um, Matthew, how much time do you spend considering you know, site conversion as opposed to you know as opposed to uh, you know reach in terms of, you know, sort of search visibility and bringing traffic in? Sorry, Miles, you were sort of breaking up quite a bit there. I don't know if I fully got it, but I'll, I'll try and answer it. I think you were asking how much do we focus on conversion rate optimization versus SEO. Was that what you were asking? It was. Okay. Uh, so the answer is if the site has traffic, lots. If the site doesn't have any traffic, not at all. <laughs> um, so, got to get traffic first before you get focus on CRO. Um, but it, it is pretty important to do. I mean, if you have traffic, obviously, if you're an enterprise type business and you sort of have just a lot of traffic because you're a big brand, you know, spending some money around CRO could give you the biggest ROI you could ever get. So, I would highly recommend that. But if you're a you know small business and you don't have a lot of traffic. And it, it may not matter as much, um, depending on the niche that you're in, um, not, not so much. So I guess the answer is it depends. We, we tend to prioritize the ones where uh, you know, legal potential clients or customers are actually engaging. So uh, phone calls, form fills, uh, downloads, email, but it really comes back to what your goal is, right? So. You know, you might have a totally different uh, goal for a call to action or a conversion that you want to measure for a blog post versus, you know, a contact page or, or some kind of other uh, page. So uh, I think the key is is to set what your conversion and your call to action that you intend to try to produce in advance, set goals for those, and then do things to meet those goals. So uh, at the end of the day, if you can tie what you're doing online to you know dollars or new business or clients or customers, I think that's where you want to be focused on. 
Um, but you know, there's a there's a lot of different things you might try to accomplish, or that's getting more subscribers, or getting people to download, or getting people getting people from Facebook even back to a site. Um, you know, th there's a variety of things you might consider a conversion event, or that you might call somebody's attention to. Uh, it's just a matter of defining those types of things. But at the end of the day, for us, it's about getting more inquiries from clients and customers, and getting those clients and customers to become actual clients and customers. Uh, Mary, can you be honest about using reviews and testimonials to impact conversion? Um, that one's a pretty easy one. Um, I like to take little snippets of comments from happy customers and just sprinkle them around the site, um, trying to make them as relevant as possible to the page that we put them on. Um, so if it's a product page, I'd like to have a snippet from somebody talking about that product. Um, and, you know, that social proof being there on just about every page in one way or another can all um, help to add up to improving your conversion. Have you done any running sort of tests on sort of pre and post conversion using testimonials and reviews, or do you, is the most of your experience kind of anecdotal and you know, historical in terms of just seeing that overall improvement? Most of my experience is anecdotal. Okay, that's great. Any of you guys use any good uh, optimization software when you're you know, either building a new site or tweaking landing pages? Any software that you would you would recommend people utilize? I don't know if it's software, but I really like Yoast plugins for WordPress. Both, you know, for local and um, this regular SEO plugin, but I don't know if that's software. Visual web. We use Visual Website Optimizer, uh, and what's that? Opti Optimizely is really good. I can't remember what it was that we we looked into both, and for some reason at the time we chose Visual Website Optimizer. And I know both tools have done a lot since then, and I've heard a ton of people say Optimizely is fantastic. Um, yeah. Both tools have been great for us, and they integrate with a few of the other things that we do. So, well, well, Visual Website Optimizer has been great for us. Yeah, we use Optimizely, uh, and it, uh, it's a pretty, a pretty effective, usable tool. So, uh, I would certainly suggest you look at that as well. Okay, let's move on to. Um, we've got a couple more topics left. Let's look firstly at structured markup. And um, you know, uh, question for Guy here: um, How important is the correct use of structured markup? And conversely to that, yeah, you know, what are the pitfalls of using it badly? Uh, I think it's very important. I think it's going to become more and more important. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that you, know, you can tell just by the way that things are presented in the index that uh, structured data uh, makes a difference in terms of how information is presented. I think that those types of things might be used in the future to distinguish sites, businesses, and pages from one another as well because there are attributes, and if you look at the schema uh, documentation, there are certain attributes of certain businesses that stand to reason, uh, you might say, well, that, that's going to influence be a factor in how we actually serve pages up. So, uh, and of course, if you mark things up incorrectly, so the obvious one would be if you put the wrong name, address, phone on your site, and you mark that up with local business schema, you could cause yourself all sorts of problems. So I think it's, I, that's one of the first things in, in part of our on-page auditing is to look at uh, if there's schema being used, what we can actually uh, add to it, if there's anything that's wrong, and then, you know, of course, use the structured data uh, testing tool, which, uh, again, you know, anytime Google's investing time or resources into do, updating something or developing something new, creating new documentation, I think it should be worth all of our attention, and they certainly are doing that when it comes to schema. Okay, that's great. That's, that's, that's a great point to make. If Google's spending time doing it, they think it's important, uh, and therefore that should uh, maybe uh, you know, require a little bit more of our, our attention. Um, uh, Mike, what content types do you typically use structured markup for on a, on a local site? And are there some that you think, you know what, I could use it, but I don't bother, so I haven't seen you know, much uplift from it? There's, uh, there's starting to be, well, I, the use to identify the business type instead of just saying local business so you can mark up um, specifically for an attorney or specifically for a certain type of business. I think that is, that is becoming a better option than just saying, hey, this is a local business. So, so that's a good one. Um, if there's products, there's some, some specific things you can do on the product side, but we're still working with a lot of service area businesses. 
Um, one of the areas that I'm I'm pretty careful on that I used to not be careful on was reviews. Um, the way that Google and the language they use to explain, uh, you know, like testimonial or review markup is that it's not testimonial markup, it's for reviews. And so if you're just taking one testimonial that you've taken and you mark that up on your website, I, I can actually see that as something that could, it, it doesn't now, but I could see that eventually negatively affecting a site um, as spam, as basically markup spam compared to if you have a platform on your website that's constantly getting reviews and you're publishing not just five-star reviews, then you have a much higher probability of actually having those, those reviews published. And a good example of that's actually U-Haul. Um, they publish any review no matter what. It doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative on their website. And, and there's some of their locations that have really low review scores and all of those scores came through their website, but they just have a, you know, they have a thing where it's like, we're going to publish it. And they have a lot of reviews marked up and, and varying reviews. And so those do show up with stars, uh, with basically the star count and the total, the total count in, in search results. Um, so that's a correct use. I know that um, uh, Mike Blumenthal and uh, Don Campbell's tool, um, the get, my, or get Five Stars tool, has a markup because you're constantly gathering reviews. So, so those pages can show the review stars. I just think you have to be careful on that side. Yes, yeah, so I guess you've got a good decision there as a business whether you go down that, that sort of pure openness route that you all did, but with the potential downside of having you know, negative reviews add to kind of potential customers. But it's interesting that it doesn't have to be someone like Yelp that can just make, up, make use of that markup. But if you're going to make use of it on a, you know, an end business site, um, you've got to be publishing not just five star reviews so you get the so you know Google gets the full uh, the full picture of your of your business. Um, Mike, staying with you on that one, microformats versus schema.org. Um, any value in using microformats or should everyone just switch over to schema? I, I think we're at the point where we should be just adopting schema compared to microformats. It used to be that when we marked up in microformats we saw more likelihood of seeing stars, especially on reviews. Um, but you know, schema is something that's been adopted by not just Google, but other search engines as well. And I think that's more important uh, in, the, in the end of things, just having, having the future in mind. And, and I think we're, we're seeing where schema could go. I think the thing that's bad about schema is it's giving Google information that then they don't need from you anymore. So they can basically, they can basically keep people from going to your website or read back that information through some voice search the functionality that they have. I mean, we're basically giving them information in a way they understand it so that they can get rid of us. But it's like, well, we still, you know, <laughs> it still helps us for the time being. I, I think 10 years from now, we're all going to say, curse you schema, you, you know, nobody comes to my website because they just get every, they get all their answers uh, because I've marked everything up. But for the time being, and not much we can do. Oh well, I guess if, uh, if businesses are still getting customers, then that's uh, uh, that's still a good thing, uh, a good thing for them. Okay, guys, we are over time today, but it's been very interesting. We've got one final section. Questions for each of you. Uh, this is what we call the hidden gems. This is basically where you guys can spill the beans on uh, the the bits that you, the tactics that you kind of keep close to your chest, the ones that you think really move the needle uh, for kind of on-site optimization. I'm going to get each of you in turn. I'm going to start off with uh, with Guy. Um, do you got anything on this? I don't know if this is uh, particularly secretive um, at the risk of saying make great content. Uh, do the hyper local pages that talk about a subject that a local community is passionate about, get them commenting and sharing and linking to the, that hyper-local page, those pages, it's really, really effective. So, you know, whatever it is, whatever, if, you're, if there's a local community, whether it's a, maybe there's an event, maybe there's, a, you know, they talked about intersections earlier, but if it's a relevant type of thing to your business and you can get people talking about it and commenting, you guys got to moderate that kind of stuff and linking to it. People are passionate about stuff at the local level. I think it's one of the exciting things about doing local search is that local communities can get really passionate online and it's extremely effective. You know, you bloggers want to link to that stuff. People want to comment on it. People want to share it. Uh, that's what I focus on. 
Great, so utilizing the local community um, to play to their strengths to get them to interact and share content. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, Mary, you next, what's your, what's your biggest hidden gem? Um, my biggest, biggest thing that I've been doing for about the past year or so is trying to grease the wheels for businesses to go out into their communities and do real world things to promote their business and their community. You know, join clubs, go to networking events, sponsor things, get your name out there in the community. And I think that, you know, for so long, we, our minds have been so warped by the way we did link building for so many years that a lot of people don't grasp that if you will do the things that we would have done before the internet, to promote your business, if you will make the effort to do those things out in your community, that that's going to pay off for you big time on that. Um, the other thing that that I think is important is rolling up your sleeves and doing the work. Being the guy who says, I don't build crappy content, I don't build crappy links, I am willing to do the hard work involved in this. Um, because what I've been seeing, especially since Pigeon hit, is that most of these panda and penguin problems that we're seeing, they're from people that are trying to take the easy way out. They've been trying to make more money by doing less work. And that thinking is really caught up to our industry in a big way. So um, I, I think that being the guy who doesn't want to automate everything, doesn't want to outsource everything, doesn't want to have offshore people doing the work, but is really willing to do what needs to be done to create good content, to do good SEO, to build good local links, that that's the trick that's actually going to work for you then. Okay, that's great. Uh, all, all round advice, uh, Mary. Uh, Mike, why don't you go then, Mike? Like, what's your, what's your, your kind of best kept secret? I would, I would say that um, the the linking structure of your location pages is is probably one of the best things you can do if you're a big business, um, and and that's where you could put a lot of focus on too. If if you're a small business, then then similar to Mary, the place that you can win is actually in your offline your offline reach and your offline brand promotion that that can be taken taken into online. Uh, online streams. So if you're at an event, take photos, um, doing different things that really a big brand really can, they struggle. They struggle being in the, the locations that they need to be. And so that's really where a local business, a, a small business can win is, is just having that human touch that the local brand can't necessarily afford or can't uh, have, have the scale at this time to reach. And so, so those those are the two things that would lead lead to the most um, for a big business or a smaller business. Okay, that's great. So both offline and online for a small business, it's about being hyper local when it's involving you know producing hyper local content for your different neighborhoods or getting involved in you know, events within you know your kind of town, city, your neighborhood. You know, it seems like almost you know where we've been living in this sort of online online sort of bubble for so long, we've forgotten you know, all the kind of traditional marketing tactics um, that uh, they used to deliver uh, kind of customers to us. Maybe kind of online is coming back and blending more with offline uh, uh, in many of the tactics that people are employing. Unfortunately, we've lost Matthew, which is a real shame. So um, everyone, uh, we've reached the end. We are over time. So thank you to all attendees who have uh, waited around and listened. Thank you very much to our four panelists for uh, sharing those excellent insights and tips. I really appreciate your time. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, we will get the recording uh, out to everyone on Friday. Uh, we'll also do a little, little write-up uh, of the, um, the webinar's kind of key points as well. So uh, we'll publish that. So uh, there's some nice takeaways for everyone to have. Um, thank you to Linda and Colin uh, for the excellent help in the Q&A. Obviously, Linda uh, saying that she was almost impossible for her to, uh, to keep up with all the questions coming through. Um, she'll publish the log of those Q&As onto uh, the local search forum. Uh, we've got two more webinars coming up uh, in February. Uh, we've got one on the 11th about uh, content creation, and then one on the 25th about uh, keyword strategies. Uh, and then actually we're just about uh, to publish the next uh, sort of phase uh, of webinars, taking us up until July. Uh, we've got a great set of speakers. Hopefully we can get these four guys 
uh, back uh, at some point, but we've got um, a whole raft of, I think, some seven different webinars uh, that we've nearly uh, kind of got um, kind of locked down now, so we'll uh, publish the details of those very soon. Uh, next, one on the 11th is about content creation ideas. Uh, we've got Don Campbell, Greg Gifford, Susan Hallam, uh, and Dave Orman, so please do uh, uh, check in for that, guys, and hope to see you all again. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thanks to our speakers. Thank you to everyone who's been involved behind the scenes. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a great Inside Local, and we'll hopefully see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks now.